Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Today we're going to be, this uh, Parks and Recreation Commission is going to be deciding on or interviewing, reviewing the design for the uh, roundabout at uh, Highway 2 and Easy Street. Um, I'm going to have, go ahead and have the uh, interviewers just uh, introduce themselves, then we'll introduce David. Okay. Um, I'm Lisa Aiden. I'm on the um, Arts, Parks, and Recreation Commission. I'm Casey Kosky, here for the same. I'm, Je <clears throat> I'm Justin Erickson with Cheyenne County PUD. I'm, uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this process. I'm Ryan Harmon with the Arts, Parks, and Recreation Committee as well. Hello, I'm Nick Rohrbach with the same committee as most yeah. everybody here. And then we have Merrill here from the City of Wenatchee. <laughs> Hi, I'm Laura Merrill. I'm the Executive Services Director for the City of Wenatchee. And my name is Lyle Markhart, and I will now turn it over to our executive director, David. All right, thanks, Lyle. Uh, Dave Erickson, Parks and Recreation Director for the city. Um, first, a couple of housekeeping items for the evaluation committee. So on your table in front of you, you guys have a spreadsheet and email and some other additional comments. Those are basically comments that were summarized from social media, uh, Wenatchee World, phone calls and emails that we've received about the project. So it's just some additional information for you. Um, for the Arts, Rec, and Park Commissioners, you guys have your agendas in front as an extra piece. Um, a couple of the presentation, uh, presenters have additional information for you here. And then to walk you through your packet. So um, in this big giant packet, you have background information. You've got the, some instructions. You've got the original call to artists. Um, you also have background on each of the design teams. So when you go to, for example, the yellow section, that kicks off with the background on that one design team, which they submitted with your original presentation. Um, what you want to really focus on, though, is dig through and find these spreadsheets. This is what your evaluation materials. So if you can fill those out um, and get them back to me, either by the end of the meeting today, or uh, if you prefer, email them to me by Thursday, then I'll take all of those, total them all up, tabulate everything, and then get them back to you. So we have that. You're going to have to dig a little bit through each section as we go along. Um, but they're in there, and they're separated out by project. So for example, this one is Specsman right here in the front. So you have that. And then the information about that project or that concept is right behind it. So all that information is there. A little bit about the project. So we were uh, asked to do this project last fall uh, in 2021. Did a call to artists from November. 15th through January 3rd, where the uh, design team submitted their qualifications. We selected the top three they're here to present today. Um, they presented their final concept or provided that to us on March 4th. Then we had a public um, review process where they were posted online and we did media outreach and had what you see in the back of the room in our office as well for viewing. Uh, that was from March 6th through the 15th. Here we are on the 15th with the presentations. From here, what we're planning on doing is bringing this back to the um, City Council Finance Committee on March 24th for their review. The City Council Public Works Committee again on April 5th, and then on to City Council for approval on April 14th, hopefully. And we'll have a final selection at that point. So you guys are doing the recommendation on, and we move on through the process uh, from here. Uh, the artists and design teams have 20 minutes each to present their concepts. So we're going to kick that off. Cami, or Cami is going to be our timekeeper back there for us. <laughs> and why don't we kick it off with uh, Miles Pepper and team. All right, are we ready? We are ready. OK, my name is Miles Pepper. I'm from Pullman, Washington. And I'm here with Mike Terrell, and landscape architect out of Spokane. And so the. The first uh, concept uh, that I want to bring about is uh, I'd like to kind of give a story about how I, I got to this point. And um, I'll, just, I'll just go into it from, from here. So in the rain shadow of the Cascade Range, and with only seven inches a year the average annual rainfall, early pioneers realized water was key in attracting new residents and agriculture to sustain them. The growth and development of Wenatchee followed the growth and development of its irrigation system. The first irrigation systems were repurposed mining canals. As the soil and climate proved well-suited for growing crops, 
Subsequent investment brought more reliable water supply and additional growth. Today's public utility districts supply water to tens of thousands of Wenatchee citizens and agricultural enterprise, sustaining a thriving and productive community in what would otherwise be a desert. To symbolize this complex man-made water delivery system, I have developed a mechanical cloud. Rainmaker is a metaphor for the human ability to shape and control their environment, creating water, growing food, and driving Wenatchee's prosperity in the otherwise dry landscape of central eastern Washington. My concept seeks to recognize and honor the planning, development, and implementation of a system more than 100 years in the making. These are a series of images of what the piece would look like. It's composed of a series of sprockets, gears, and pelton wheels. Supported on a number of legs that lifted up off the ground, meant to look like rain coming out of a billowing cloud. The scale on this is somewhere in the 35 to 40 feet high. And this next slide shows a video of how these might rotate in a kind of different directions at different speeds. And this would be like as if you were driving around it or walking around it. This next slide, slide shows uh, proportional how large it would be in the roundabout. And I'll let Mike talk a little bit about the landscaping concept we had on this. Our initial thought is that the landscape, is, particularly in this piece, would be reflective of the agricultural history in the rows and the orchards in the valley. So, it, so you have the cloud, you have the rain coming down, and then the orchards in, in, uh, in rows. And one of the things we looked at too is making sure that it's low maintenance, so it's minimal maintenance in the in the middle of the roundabout, but also so provide color and also an attraction for pollinators to reinforce that that agricultural history as well. So as we get into more detail or get the opportunity to do more detail in landscape design, reinforcing what Miles has done here, we'd investigate those issues a lot in more detail. This would be another view. One of the things we're looking at is uh, providing kind of an access uh, road, uh, not necessarily a road, would you call it a driveway or something on this? That yeah, so that uh, maintenance folks either working on the piece or working in the landscape can drive up into the roundabout so they're not on the apron at all, so that they make it clear. We work in other, other, um, with other art and roundabouts, and that's been an issue because it becomes kind of a hazard for personnel working in there. So creating that opportunity to get a pickup or a lift truck into the roundabout and make it look not like it's a driveway to park a lift truck in. So. This is one more view. Uh, do you have any questions? In what, we have five minutes maybe? <laughs> I like the addition of the parking area or a disguised parking area for a maintenance vehicle. Um, yeah, something I am pleased to hear you guys were thinking about. I know I'm a project engineer at the city of Wenatchee as well, so deal in transportation. And I know that was a big issue just in general for all of the concepts, mm -hmm. uh, providing um, a responsible way of accessing the maintenance outside of dodging traffic and making it the center. That's a pretty cool idea. I've seen in a number of your other designs that you often used um, you know, wind power and kinetic, um, but in this particular outline, you've highlighted a long life gear drive electric motor. Um, do you have experience with that electric motor and the sealed bearings um, in our climate in particular? 
Yeah, I've built a number. All of the projects I work on have uh, uh, bearings that are sealed up, and I, I do. You know, I have special tricks I do to minimize the amount of friction a seal might cause, but still keep it sealed. Uh, the shafts would be stainless, and, and uh, typically on my work, once I put it up, I never go back to lubricate it. All, all of these bearings are rated for highway speeds, basically, in, in most cases. And all of my work that I built in the past never comes close to doing it. So basically, the bearing is going to last forever, and I pack the whole volume inside with grease. It's, it's basically zero maintenance at that point in, ter in terms of lubrication. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And, and part of the reason why I want to use electric for this is because several of these don't really have wind catching devices on them. And I also looked at the table uh, for wind in Wenatchee. It's pretty quiet here compared to uh, Pullman, which, you know, we, we're, I think today we're getting 40 mile an hour wind. So um, I, I just figured that I, I needed to do something on this piece. Okay. Any more questions? We do it on time. Okay. I'll close out this one. Escape. So again, on on this, my second proposal. I have a little bit of a story on, on how I arrived at these things. I spent a lot of time kind of digging down into Wenatchee, reading a lot of books, going through the internet, poking around everywhere I could to find out, you know, what's special about Wenatchee? And, and uh, I'll just go in from here. On May 27, 1987, while installing an irrigation pipe through an apple orchard in East Wenatchee, orchard workers uncovered a cache of 11 to 12,000 year old prehistoric tools known as Clovis points buried about 20 inches below the surface. In the archaeological world, this was a huge find. These were the biggest Clovis points ever discovered. And it was also the largest cache of uh, un undisturbed Clovis points ever found. There was a number of different types of tools in here. Some of these were for carving, uh, they think, and some other miscellaneous points. This was a particularly beautiful point, I thought. This was another drawing they documented them with. Uh, continuing to research Clovis points, I discovered they were part of a local legend. Inspired by oral historian Randy Lewis's narrative of the dragon specimen, I began thinking about a sculpture that would symbolize the battle between native Wenatchee and the river dragon that lived at the confluence of the Wenatchee and the Columbia Rivers. This was the book that he and uh, William Lehman recently published about this. In the legend, native twins Red Star and Blue Star battle the dragon specksmen at the mouth of the Wenatchee River. Armed with special spear points like those discovered in East Wenatchee, the twins defeat the menacing specksmen, bringing peace and security to the valley. Tied to the many surrounding geological landmarks, the legend is fixed to the river valley. The saddle to the west is the specksman's horns. Rock Island, its head. The Stamilt pinnacles, its spine and ribs. And the sharp river rock downstream, its claw. The powerful specksman is described as a shapeshifter, changing from water to vapor to fog to lightning. To express this amorphous form through my own vision, I have created a whirling entity of stacked horizontal water wheels counter-rotating with the breeze. This swirling entity is trapped and supported between two spear points rising above a foundation of columnar basalt. This is a series of uh, digital images that we've created that would render this. Again, this would be 35 to 40 feet tall. The surface on the uh, spear tips is what's called a meshed surface. You notice that it's asymmetrical. It's made up of a series of triangular planes, which makes it a little bit easier for me, me to make, but it also resembles more like a, a napped uh, obsidian spear point. And then the pieces inside the, the water wheels are essentially like pelton wheels mounted on a horizontal plane. 
but they rotate backwards to each, each other in a stack. This would be looking down from the top. And this is a, a video as if you were walking around. Now in this video, I have the wheels as being white and blue. That sort of designates, for us it was a drafting trick, trying to remember which one goes which way. But um, what we're thinking about now is maybe painting these just one color blue on the outside of the cups and another color on the inside. So as these cups rotate when the breeze kicks up like it is today, these things are going to shimmer blue on the outside, maybe green on the inside. And this whole thing, since they're going back and forth, will be like a little miniature living tornado thing trapped between the spear points. This shows what it would look like at the uh, center of the roundabout. So from a landscape standpoint, that area, the lighter area going through, that would be the access point. Um, and we talked about maybe that being exposed aggregate or something else like that, or even stamped concrete with hexagonal stamp. Um, the plant material selection in this one may be lean more towards native plants, sages and, and native and adapted plants, so that we're really kind of reflecting the, uh, the character and the, the history kind of behind the art itself. Another view. Any questions? I would be concerned about the possibility of that shimmering quality being distraction to drivers trying to go through the uh, through the roundabout. You know, uh, I've done it several pieces in a roundabout and. It, one of the last ones I just did um, was in Federal Way, and it was close to I-5, and there was so much concern about that, and, and you know, the reality of it is it never, none of it was ever married by the time we got done. And the, what happens when people come into roundabout, I mean, the simple rule to remember about a roundabout is yield in, signal out. Once you, once you memorize that, it's so easy to go through these things. And what you're doing when you come to the roundabout, you're not looking at the artwork anymore. You're looking at the car coming from your left. And, you know, my experience has been that, you know, when you put artwork in the roundabout, it sounds like a great idea in some ways, but the drivers never see it. <laughs> Unless, you know, they see it on their approach. They, oh, yeah, they, they, it becomes a landmark for that. But most of the time, they get so used to coming into the roundabout, they're, they're looking at, to their left and concentrating on their path through. Would you anticipate any lighting uh, being incorporated? We could, um, this is again another, another uh, piece I did, we incorporated a lighting system to illuminate the top and it even had a sensing system to tell when vehicles were around that, that it would become more active, it would go to sleep otherwise. Um, but they, they put up these uh, sodium halide lights all around the thing and it, it, uh, we tried to convince them to put some shrouds around to block the art piece. But, they didn't want to do it. it. It would be easy to add lighting because we do have electricity in the roundabout. Um, and that would be you know, an easy way to do that. It would have to be pretty intense to illuminate that given the lighting that's around the outside. But if they plan in, they make these shrouds that go around these lights that would keep it just on the roundabout, not so much on the art piece. If that were incorporated, you know, I think there would be a lot more promise for that. Could you? repeat the materials that are going to be used for the spears and then the centerpiece? So all of the centerpiece are made out of uh, fabricated aluminum. Yeah. And in between the two spear points, there's going to be a series of bridge pieces going back and forth. And they're constructed in such a way, you'll notice the, the spiraling thing that kind of oscillates. Where it's, where it's close to both sides is well where we will bridge across. Uh, to tie the two spear points together, that makes the whole structure infinitely more stable at that point as well. And then where it's closer just to one side, we'll support it from one side. And the last two or three at the top and the bottom are actually self-supported by an offsetting spindle process on the inside. So it makes it appear as if it's floating. The, the spear points right now, uh, what I'm thinking about is that 
we will uh, build them in two halves so they can bolt together. Each half will be a frame made of steel with all the triangles worked out. And then we will skin it with these aluminum triangles that are probably powder coated. Yeah, it'll make it lighter that way as well. Thank you. On the foundation would be cast concrete uh, to look like basalt. And of course, we'd have another cast engineered foundation underneath. And I think I cleared with the engineer already that there, there were no utilities running underneath the, uh, the roundabout, which was kind of funny because all the other projects I've done in roundabouts have been stuff crisscrossing everywhere. Yeah. Do you have an estimation of what the maintenance cost of this would be? Uh, again, uh, for all of the moving parts in the center, uh, I'd use a, a, a bearing that's rated for speeds that are way higher. They're sealed, so water can't get into them. And uh, they, generally, they go on either side of a cartridge, and I fill the inside with grease. So um, these things are going to run forever uh, without needing a maintenance on that. And this one is not motorized. I figure it's interesting enough just standing still on a calm day. But if you do get enough days like this, this piece is going to pick up and be moving. Anybody else? All right, Judge Floyd, is that all the questions for? I think so. Is that all? Fantastic. Well, thanks, gentlemen. Appreciate you coming and, and doing that presentation. And you, want, you can you absolutely want stick around and watch the others. You want to do that? These guys are up next. I'll copy. He was going to copy the two oh, files in there. I'm safe. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, you guys. <laughs> Lots of information. All right. Let's minimize this. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> That's asking a lot. Yeah. And I do have all no your pressure. other pressure. Yeah. All your other stuff is is here as well. And which whichever one works for you, I just. Saving the bunch. So okay. The first one there, the DS. Yeah, this one? Not down to. And then. Okay, so they're right here. Good. You can choose whichever one. Yeah, whichever one like. opens, I guess. CJ, whenever you're ready. Yeah, it looks like everybody. Oh, that's loud. It looks like everybody's reading everything they found there. My name is CJ Ranch. I'm an artist from Hood River, Oregon. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this project and some proposals. Um, I've had a bit of a rough week, so bear with me. Um,
I've been at this game for 14 years. Um, I've done 51 large scale public works in 29 different states. The reason there's 29 states and 51 works of art is because a lot of these states ask me to come back and do other projects because we do our projects on time, within budget, and always greater than what we promised. Um, I'm proud to say that. I'm proud to share that with people. Uh, that's a long part of my resume there. And uh, it's always fun to work with the same groups again, and so everybody gets to know each other, and, and we know what to expect, and it makes it easier moving forward. But with those 29 different states and all those works, I've had the opportunity to work with stakeholders of all types, from architects designing a building, designing a specific roadway, how they want it, and finding how we can uh, navigate that together to figure out what exceeds their expectations for them and their community and everything else. Um, of those uh, projects, 27 of them, I've had to inter uh, work with the Department of Transportation of that state. So we've got a lot of uh, experience working with different types of Department of Transportation, scheduling things, getting cranes in and off site as soon as we can, picking the right times and, and uh, days to move things in and out. <clears throat> a little bit of experience helps a lot. It goes a long way with the Department of Transportation. Um, so when I started researching Wenatchee, uh, I actually went to school in Tri-Cities, spent a lot of time here at Mission Ridge, was in the ski industry for years before I started this job. Uh, so I knew Wenatchee a little bit, but I wanted to start renewing some information, renewing what's changed, what's different. And one of the things that really grabbed me um, was the Sahaptan name for Wenatchee that translates to Robe of the Rainbow or Place of the Rainbow. My wife, she works with the native uh, tribes up and down the Columbia and gets them into school systems to, treat, to teach their, their native history. Um, so I, I keep coming back to that native thing and it, and it kept speaking to me to the point that I, I wanted to do something with the rainbow, but uh, being that I'm not native, I didn't want to go down that road without a native uh, artist on my team um, or use their name in any, any way, shape, or form. But I, I really like this idea of the rainbow, of how the colors of the valley change throughout the year and how it reflects the, the fruits of the valley and how it reflects the rivers of the valley and how all that came together. And I started taking these, these ideas of the design themes that David had sent us about the hydropower and different aspects of Wenatchee. And, and here I was researching some hydropower and these, the distribution of hydro, hyd, the hydrodynamics, and, I'm, and I keep seeing these rainbows. And I keep seeing these rainbows. So I kept coming back to this idea of the rainbow and tying it in, into the valley. And you even see in some of the, the hydro testing, they even use some of these shapes of their testing and how... The dynamics comes from the dam down through the turbines to, to give energy and how important that was for the Wenatchee Valley. And so I started trying to think of how I could incorporate that in a sculpture. Um, and I, I, you know, because of the size of this roundabout, it has to be big. You've got, you've got a sizable roundabout and you want to get people's attention from afar, but then give them some type of an, an experience when they get up close as well. And one of the challenges of, of an artist is to come up with something that local see once, and they find something new in that sculpture every time they drive by. So there's a little bit more interest. It's not just, oh yeah, that's something we, that's been there for years. It's, to me, it's more finding a deeper connection. So people, as they come through all the time, whether you're you know, local and you drive by there every day, or you're just visiting, something you can find in there that reminds you where you are. And um, so I, I, I was just thinking of this tall kind of a totem idea uh, which seems to be a pretty good theme behind me, what I see on your table, to take up that size of the roundabout from afar. And I started thinking of what builds a strong community, these different windows and different points of view of everybody. And I started peeling away this, this column. It, it started as a square, and I started peeling away this column to add these windows and to add these different points of view. And then I started to think of what colors would work in there. Uh, how we can incorporate this rainbow idea without making it look like a rainbow. And um, I, I kept looking at it as a square, and I, I, 
I turned it into a triangle to give it more depth and more excitement as you pass, because it would, it would be ever-changing as you travel around the roundabout. And then I made the upper uh, wave in there to mimic the hills and the, and the swirls in the river. And I started adding color, and, and I came up with the colors of the seasons and the colors of the fruit and the colors of the rivers and the colors of the sunsets and the colors of the sky. And one of the reasons I like to use acrylic in my pieces is it's a 25-year UV stable. It's replaceable if by chance somebody hits it or throws a rock or decides to be just that type of an individual. Um, but it's semi-translucent, and when you, when you mix those mediums with the acrylic and with the stainless, you get this. And this isn't even lit. This is on a, on a cloudy day. But it's this very vibrant look. It's, it's this colorful look. It's vibrant. It's ever-changing. And then if you, when you get some sun to feed through it, you end up with this. You end up with some color shadows that it throws all over. So it's really bright, and it gets your attention on a, on a cloudy day and on a sunny day especially. Um, my concept with this, too, would be to light this internally at night. A little, a little external lighting, just so you would see the stainless steel as well, but more so an internal light. So during the day, you'd see the framing. It, it changes quite drastically from night to, to daylight. During the daylight, what you really see is, is the frame, like you're seeing here. And at night, the framing goes away, and you just see the colorful aspects. But if we uplight it a little bit from the outside, you pick up a little bit of the flash of the stainless steel. Um, the other concept behind this is it's zero maintenance. Barring any dirt or dust, you can just spray it down uh, once a year or let the rain do the work and uh, keep it clean. This is a tree where I've used a similar application. These are the, the leaves, actually, you see. This is a 30-foot tree, and these leaves are, this is a shadow from 30 feet above. So there's a lot of light play happening there in this three-sided uh, form. And then I, then I was looking at all the themes still, and I was actually working with two different models. I had one that was a confluence of rivers, and I had this, this one that I was working with. And I kept tying back into all these aspects of the design themes. This is why I only presented one, is because I was able to put all these design themes in a, in a single sculpture. And then I started thinking through, you know, how do we get the local culture, local recreation, the pollinators, and the things they were asking for? And so I developed then the blades that go around the base of the sculpture, which mimic the turgo blades of, of Hydro Dam and how they generate power. And the idea here was to use eight blades that signify the eight top varieties of uh, apples grown in the valley. And within those blades and have the ability to either uh, laser cut or laser etch into them. The core 10, if you're familiar with it, it's a, it's a steel that rusts itself to seal itself, but it has a nice orangey tint to it. So it's, it's a really pretty color that would really frame the stainless steel and the acrylic well, but give us the opportunity to then add pollinator box, removable pollinator box areas, as was asked for in some of the themes, where we could put pollinator plantings around the area and then have removable pollinator boxes that maybe a local middle school or a local high school could help manage. Um, these can be replaceable or these can be permanent. That's up to you guys to decide. Um, as well as include icons of uh, both cultural icons, if I would work with the History Museum to get the proper icons that they feel would represent the natives, I would love to do that. Um, or icons that are just landmarks of Wenatchee's growth and the things that make Wenatchee Wenatchee. Um, there's ample of space to put eight large icons or even a couple different icons, even, you know, maybe there's a wing that's recreation and you have your hiking and your skiing and your biking and, and, and that would be on one blade and then move it around to have your hydropower and the farming and the ag section. Um, that's something, I, rather than me choose, I would rather work with somebody on a committee. Um, I've actually gone into schools and spent the whole days with grade school uh, kids to come up with ideas and concepts, which is always a great way to get the community buy-in on those situations. Um, that way everybody's confident that everybody buys in and represents each cultural element to the best it can. Um, 
And this is just a bigger picture of how the blades would work with the removable pollinator boxes from the back and uh, the ability to etch or laser cut those other forms in there. The concept behind this is as you drive around the form, you're always finding something different. You'll see the major form, which is the colorful uh, valley of fruition, and then you would have these little elements as you go around and find some, a little something to discover every time that you go around. Um, and the name was good. Uh, you know, I, I really was inspired by the this Hapton name, but I know culturally I, I can't use that name. So when I, I still like the valley idea and the valley of the rainbow, but I came up with valley of fruition because it has so many different meanings. There's a little play on words there, whether it's actually bearing fruit or the accomplishments of the valley or, you know, just something attained or realized. And I just thought that was a really good way to sum it up where everybody in town, regardless of why you're here or why you chose to stay or how long your family's been here, there's a little something that really speaks to you as an individual there. So you can see from the model kind of the idea of the landscape plan is um, pretty minimal pollinator uh, plantings to the inside, minimal low planting to the outside, um, and just really concentrate on that drought resistant because I know everybody I always work with, it's we want zero maintenance, zero maintenance, zero maintenance, um, and that is what you have here with the stainless, the acrylic, and the core 10. Um, you know, obviously with the size of the pillar, with the size of the main sculpture, there'll have to be an access window. So if there is something damaged that needs to be replaced or repaired in there, it can be done easily by um, city guys. We come out and do work, but that's ultimately what I like to do is create work that the city can maintain themselves if there's an issue. Um, so all that kind of thought and all that experience has gone into that design for you. Any questions? Just going to ask, there's no, no moving parts uh, at all, just, just fixed materials and... Yep. The only real maintenance, if there was any, would be any of the lighting. Um, no, no offense, but when I usually see zero maintenance, I take moving parts out of it for that reason. Thanks. Anything else? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I like the three miles down the road. All right, gentlemen, Greg, Thad, come on down. We do, for, for the Arch Rec and Park Commissioners in the group, we have a couple of small business items right after this. Okay. So you can, don't just run away. If you just <laughs> stick around, we'll handle those things. Let everybody else run away, but then you guys have to cover those. Which one are you guys doing first? Uh, spring or Caribbean? Well, it's it's just kind, kind of, of on. Yeah. So we start off with a little bit about both and then turbulence and then spring. Got it. Okay. You guys will want to have both of you, probably both of you. So we start with turbulence, basically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's good. All right, whenever you're ready. All right. Uh, my name is Greg Schlanger and my partner here. Yeah, my name is Thad Brewer. I uh, am a, a former Wenatchee. I lived here for 28 years and then wound up going to school at uh, Central Washington. I live over in Muckatino, but I've got a lot of experience at what I feel like makes the, view, the valley a beautiful place. I live in uh, Ellensburg, over the hill, uh, chair of the Department of Art and Design at Central. Um, let's see, arrow key? Oh, here we go. 
So um, it, both of our designs, as we as we looked around and and, and thought about, um, you know, how to, how to you know approach this project, um, we were really inspired by the railroads and the trestles and the visual that's created, uh, you know, and the importance of the railroad to the history of the area, and and also just the sense of the the trestles as a visual language and, and something that's common, something that's recognizable for you know for people. In general, um, you know, I, I'm attracted to it as an artist. You know, partly because of the repetition, rep, repetition in, uh, of the shape and the form, and so we we decided to go ahead and, and use that as kind of the structural form for both projects. Uh, the materials, all right. Uh, so the materials that we've, we're, we're using in, in both projects also um, is, is is glass and steel. So the glass uh, is. Uh, manufactured at Gold Ray Glass. It's uh, a company I, I've used. I just used uh, the, their materials in a project uh, for the state of Washington uh, for a high school in Lacey. And um, it is a 9 16 inch thick. It's two tempered plates. It is, uh, it's colorized to, to my specifications or our specifications. And then it's a digital ceramic frit uh, printing process. So it's kind of like an inkjet printer but uh, it's digital, it's a it's ceramic frit that's put on the glass and uh, then it's tempered, so it is brought up to a very high temperature and then the two plates are laminated. So it's, um, uh, you know, the state went through their conservation process uh, of materials and things as they looked at this and, and um, you know, approved this for use at a plaza in a high school. Um, so it's, it's, it's rather stable. Um, it has, you know, a lifespan of, it doesn't fade. I mean, the way it's produced, um, uh, the uh, Gold Ray maintains all the digital files. So if something did happen or something needed to be replaced, one piece or something else, it, it's not a huge ordeal um, so that it's maintained that way. There are samples back here on the table. Please, I invite you to, to go check those out. There's one that's, uh, that they sent, I just received the other day, that has a sample printing of the uh, half tones that we're going to talk about here in a little bit. Yeah, the uh, structure itself that would hold the glass uh, is going to be made out of uh, H-beam and channel steel is the plan uh, to resemble as well as mimic the train trestles that we're talking about. And a lot of our bridges, uh, irrigation, you know, the uh, pipelines that move over the river, they all have very similar construction in their linear elements cross members, and that's what we see uh, essentially utilizing those same components in the way of the H-beams and the cross structures. Um, it would be fabricated, you, unlike the model that uh, doesn't show the fine detail, it would be using a lot of uh, bolts that would resemble the rivet structure that you see on all of the train trestles, um, as well as then being hot, hot dip galvanized afterwards which by DOT standards for their bridges and stuff have a 50 plus year lifespan. And I would see in the, the location that it is, a uh, structure like this would easily last over 100 years. So with, with these materials, it's, it's mostly it's maintenance free. I mean, there would be, recommend a, you know, annual kind of just visual inspection, but it's, it would require no maintenance. Yeah, we, uh, we also see from a standpoint of getting the larger sculpture, uh, elevating, you know, putting a raise to it. Uh, it. The amount of cement that's going to hold it up anyways, uh, we, we would essentially see for this sculpture, turbulent waters, raising the grade up, which should help. Also, we work with DOT and the city to determine from a safety standpoint, you know, how much of a deterrent do you want to see? Um, and potentially even laying out some large uh, basalt boulders around the outer area, which could also work as, a, I guess, an inhibitor to somebody, you know, driving up into it. Um, the structure itself, though, I, I cannot see an automobile damaging it. It, it would merely be a matter of the, the automobile being damaged. Um, the, uh, the grade would probably be... Uh, Crushed basalt, possibly some xeriscaping, again, aiming for zero maintenance and 
you know, zero budget for maintenance. We're starting with that, and easily we could work in some other pollinators or light landscaping, again, coordinating with whatever the city might like to see from that uh, long-term maintenance standpoint. The, uh, the primary part of this sculpture is the water, the turbulent waters um, reflecting back to the lifeblood, lifeblood of the Wenatchee Valley. Uh, since history is time, I think the, the rivers have provided transportation. They have provided uh, irrigation for crops. Um, they have ultimately led to us having uh, the benefits of PUD power at incredibly reduced rates compared to the rest of the nation, which has created a, a founding of economic opportunities for the area as well. So we see water as really being the lifeblood of the area and really want to just showcase that. And this also, with the glass, you really get two sculptures uh, being illuminated by LED lighting. Uh, you'll get a completely different sculpture in the evening and at nighttime in the dark than what you would see during the daytime, as well as with the change in lighting, just with clouds and sunshine. So for the, the, the printing on the glass and to create the image of water, uh, we've decided to go with halftone uh, half images so that it's, it's, um, you, this, this demonstrates a little bit of the, the dots that, that would be there. I mean, these largest dots are going to be, you know, it's more like a half dollar size uh, on, the, on this scale that we're talking about. These are um, uh, six by six panels, uh, each square of glass. And uh, but from a distance, you're gonna you're gonna it's gonna read as a photograph of water, um, and uh, so that it uh, as one approaches the roundabout, it's gonna create some movement. And as the image changes a little bit, as one moves around it, um, so that the, the half tones that we feel is a, is a really great way to, to illustrate yeah, this. Yeah, the half tone printing allows the light to pass through even where the image is, so that the image is constantly changing. As you move around it, that and artistically, I like the fact that it's made up of little circles, which is what the roundabout. So for this structure, we're we're uh, proposing four uh, different images of falling water on each on each side. Um, with the extension of installation of this project, now we're kind of a little bit excited because it gives us a little more time to work with you in selecting what those four images of falling water would be. Um, these are our, our initial proposals here of of this, but. Um, so I think that uh, we'd be excited to continue this exploration. We kind of ran out of time a little bit. Um, but so there'll be 16 uh, of these uh, six by six panels of glass. They might be broken up into three pieces, vertical pieces, uh, as a way to kind of ease up on weight and for installation purposes. And we'll work with a, a glazier to, to decide the best way to, to put those up. So this is the, the raising the elevation. I think a lot of the things that, that Tad's already talked about with this. Um, any questions on this before we move on to the next project? I actually had a question when I was looking at the information ahead of time. Is this a separate project uh, in, to the one that you're going to propose now? In other words, Turbulent waters, and then there was the other. Yeah, yeah so turbulent straight, waters and, and then straight. So these are, yeah, yeah, we were asked to do two proposals. This one okay. would be relevant yes. to the PUD uh -huh. as well as the community, but focusing on the water. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Uh -huh. And then this project, Strength, is, is the one that we see focusing on the culture of Wenatchee. I just want to clarify um, so you do anticipate doing some sort of landscaping on on the bottom or you mentioned earlier that you could do native or what would what, what are your thoughts on yeah filling up it, that space? from from being just graded crushed basalt which is essentially going to be zero maintenance you're not going to have any type of uh, water drainage issues mm -hmm. um, versus having a large paved area um, not knowing what type of long-term maintenance budgeting there is and or ingress and egress into a roundabout intersection that has up to 50,000 cars rolling through every day. Yeah. We thought it would be best, 
be best to plan on the simple side and then work with the city to develop anything beyond that. Got it. Thank you. So strength is the second concept proposal that uh, we have developed. Um, as artists that are influenced by our mothers, our wives, and our daughters, we recognize the critical role that women play in our lives, in our communities, and the way that they inspire us. Women are trailblazers that are instrumental in defining so many things that take place in our communities and our culture. And we feel that this piece would be an excellent, bright and colorful way to acknowledge the diversity and the uh, women of Wenatchee's history that have played a critical role. Um, so this piece, again, it's, it's using the same glass and it is a, a half-tone print where the, the water piece uh, was using a white uh, a ceramic frit for the imagery to, you know, to you know, the idea of white water, where this would be using a black uh, a print, a printing process. Um, uh, the, this would be 20 feet tall, and uh, the glass is uh, five by five feet. And so with both of these, we're leaving this space open on the bottom. Partly, it's, it's a little bit of a visible, you know, as I'm driving, uh, and also thinking about vandalism and, and, and maintenance, if there is anything growing around them. Um, uh, but they'll each have the three panels and there'll be five individual pieces uh, placed in this around the circle. Um, the, the, there would be a variety of glass colors. There's a few samples here, but we'll add, a, you know, there'd be a few others added. And, and the idea of the, the, the various colors is, is the, another way to, to represent diversity of what these uh, the images would be in the women. These also would be half-tone uh, images, and it's, it always messes with my eyes a little bit as I see these at different distances. Um, but this is, <clears throat> the one on the left is just a close-up of that right eye area, um, and so you get a sense of how that would be. But again, this would be very much seen as a portrait from a distance, and it would change as you move through it and move around it, so there would be um, changing image. Yeah, and in, in this case you would also be seeing as you move around with the position of the sun, you know, colored light coming through as well as an image being cast uh, on the uh, ground around it as well. So we've, uh, I, you know, in the, in the model and in the presentation there are a few examples of some women that we found uh, as important women in the historical museum in the second floor there. So that's where many of these images came from. These are samples. Uh, we would propose working with the community and uh, coming up with, with ways to engage different groups within the community, from the uh, tribe to uh, migrant workers to local uh, uh, you know, folks, the History Museum, uh, to identify who these might be and then work with the selection process with you all in, in what that would be and who that would be. So these are just some of those examples. And some great stories already here in the museum. The other thing that, that we would add is that on the pedestrian walkway, there's two corners where there is a larger areas and sidewalks. And so on that, we would propose to add a sixth element. And, um, the, and determining on the site of that, we'll determine it a little bit, but it'll be something very similar, but a smaller scale with, with again, Similar construction, the metal, the, the galvanized steel, the glass, smaller versions of the portraits, and text that does tell the story of each of these women. So that would be uh, as a side note for the pedestrians, because we don't expect anybody driving around to try to read anything, um, but it would be, you know, the idea is it's, it's visual in that sense, but there is another level of engagement for the pedestrians. Yeah, and having uh, spoken briefly with the project manager, with the DOT, and finding out that there will be some minimal landscaping and a few trees being placed, that any landscaping that we did, we would try and coordinate so that it, it felt suitably fit with the other stuff that they'd be putting in. So again, this would be um, in a raised area, uh, some sort of slope. Uh, my 
my experience and and most of the public art managers that I've talked to um, that have dealt with roundabout artwork um, indicate quite often it's hit by a car so that this is partly of one of the things is to keep it a little bit more in the center and and raise that elevation up to prevent. yeah and we would see each one of these two being sitting up on its you know cement an elevated cement foundational block which provides essentially that's that's what a car would hit if they came up onto the thing and then that also puts it all up large enough that even out on the second car going around the roundabout it's going to be visible to passengers in the car are going to be able to actually see the entirety of the artwork moving around the roundabout as well as that much more visible from the vantage points that there are you know coming across the bridge from East Wenatchee and some of these other areas having been out there to evaluate the site there are a lot of uh, a lot of good vantage points that this stuff especially at nighttime where it's lit up can be very uh, very attractive to look at so on the sense of lighting, you know, we're proposing to um, do some LED lighting. Um, ideally, you know, the, the least expensive way is to have lighting up lighting. But I know where I live, there are um, some ordinances that don't allow that. And I don't know if that exists in Wenatchee or not. So we would, we would look into that. And if, if that's the case, there's other ways to, to have down lighting on all of these structures. Um, the, the turbulent water one really just needs one light in the center. It would illuminate that in the evening. It could either be from the very top going down or the bottom going up. Thank you so much for your consideration and the opportunity to be here today. Is yeah. there any questions? Any other questions? The, uh, the, is it the glass etch, is the, it's printing, is it etching? Like no, 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 it's not. Uh, imagine an inkjet printer, but it's instead of ink, it's putting out a ceramic frit uh, yeah. in a liquid sense onto a surface, onto the surface of the glass. Then that sheet of glass is tempered, so it's basically going into a kiln, okay. um, uh, and and that then the ceramic material is becoming one with the glass, yeah. and that's on the inside layer. And then those two, one side has the uh, the layer of the color. One has the frit, and then those are laminated together. So it's sealed in the center. There's, it's not going anywhere. It's yeah, it essentially becomes one piece of glass made out of the two tempered sheets, and it is sealed and color fast for life. Then you, the, the, there's one here that has a printing on it. So you can see that. Is that it? Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank, you thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, no, we can. My people. So I want to thank the artists again for coming out and presenting and putting in all the work on these final presentations. It's, uh, you guys are going to have a tough day. They're awesome. Um, so the Arts Rec and Park Commission, uh, well, actually, all evaluators, if you can either Give me your forms today before you leave or email them to me tomorrow. That would be much appreciated so we can continue on with the process. And then Arts Rec and Park Commission, we have a couple business items we have to take care of. So you can just hang around for a couple minutes. We'll take care of that too. I don't know if I can score them all right now. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, there's no way.